All right, so happy to have uh, Jana Diesner uh, today. Jana's been doing stuff with Siri for uh, at least a couple of years. Uh, so and, uh, enthusiastically, I should say. That's one of the things I always like. <laughs> enthusiastically with some challenges um, that come from working at the University of Illinois and <laughs> with me and with Randy. So, so you, you roll with it. That's good. So, yeah, associate professor at, uh, at the iSchool. Um, leads the Social Computing Lab, Research in Social Computing and Human-Centered Data Analysis. It's data Science, Combining Methods from National Language Processing, Social Network Analysis, and Machine Learning with Social Sciences. All right, so let's see, important things here. Got a PhD from uh, Carnegie Mellon in 2012. One thing that I don't see on here, but I think I know, is you are you were a Siebel Scholar, aren't you? That is true. That I is got true. a Siebel Fellowship. That's right, Siebel Scholarship. That's right. Well, this is important ago. when you you know we're not in the Siebel Building, but that you is know, true. Considering the investment the mm -hmm. man makes in this place, we need to call it out when it happens. Pro so probably, here we go. probably. All right. Well, in any case, it's, yeah, I'll take it away. Thank you. Thanks for the kind introduction. I appreciate it. I'm also happy to see so many people from our group here. Thanks all for showing up. Um, so hey, I'm Jana. Um, I'm very excited to present this work um, that was done in collaboration of some of my graduate students. One of them is sitting right there. Hey, Lee. Hey, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and also Ming and Janina, um, who are at courses and conferences right now and couldn't be here. Um, before we start, I would also like to thank the Siri team at Illinois for all their support um, throughout the whole process for the first um, support we had from them and also the second round. It's been a great pleasure working with you guys. All right, so let's get started. I'll give you a little bit of an overview over the project we did last year, and then I'll jump into um, my project from this year. Um, I'm happy to take questions anytime. I'm not sure if we are feeding questions from the online participants, but I'm sure our tech people have that all under control because they are total pros at doing that on a weekly basis. And they'll make sure we hear from people in the online audience as well. We are also happy to receive feedback um, after the talk through email, so we are happy to follow up on these things. All right, so let's get started. <clears throat> Um, last year, we had a pleasure of um, working with Siri and a couple of Siri um, partners on a project where we tried to develop some best practices for practitioners, and by that we don't mean scientists or scholars necessarily, but first responders out in the field for helping them to leverage existing tools and technologies in a trustworthy and reliable way to gain a comprehensive and accurate understanding of situational awareness um, of emergencies. <clears throat> Our question there was, how can we make use of the different information sources that are out there and different methods and different implementations of methods in order to quickly and accurately synthesize large amounts of publicly available text data collections in order to understand what's going on, what's happening, and how do people feel about it. Um, that comes from a shift in information technologies and sources related to emergencies. In the good old days, there were authoritative or formal sources, professionally generated and curated content. Now we also have access, and by we I mean really mean everybody. We have access to user-generated content that comes from all sorts of sources and places and may help us or not to supplement our understanding of events um, as they are emerging. Um, a lot of practitioners do not yet have standards, protocols, and policies for how to use methods from machine learning and artificial intelligence and data science in general in order to leverage and synthesize large volumes of um, the information that is potentially available. And what we are trying to do here is just to fill a little bit of a gap there and see which of these sources, methods, and technologies can be best used in what, um, under what scenarios. All right. 
So, um, since this is work um, with Siri and um, in the end funded by the Department of Homeland Security, there are a couple of goals that are um, very important to us and to our project partners and to our funders here. One of them is saving time. Um, and we do that by basically leveraging machine learning and artificial intelligence methods to quickly sift through large amounts, large volumes of data and extract the essence from these data. We also aim to save money by not developing things from scratch, but leveraging what's already out there um, and developing best practices for making a choice about all these things that are out there um, and to know how to make a good decision for what um, technology to use. And last not but not least, we aim to contribute to saving lives by helping first responders and practitioners, but also scholars, to gain a quick, comprehensive, and reliable um, understanding of disaster events and um, the responses to them. So what we did here is um, we developed an uh, experimental design where we always hold one thing constant and then vary the others. That's a very classic thing that scientists do as they go through their professional day. And we have three things here that we look at. Um, first of all, when you work with emergency um, and disaster information, there are a lot of sources you can leverage. Um, there's regular news media. There's also social media now. There are experts that write blogs. There are professionally generated documents out of the government. And last but not least, there are the people actually on the ground who are doing the response. And we looked at all of these sources. Now, when you collect a lot of data from these sources, which with the exception for actual people on the ground is a fairly easy thing to do, in terms of getting a whole lot of stuff really quickly, um, then how do you go through that? Reading them is obviously not an option because that's highly repetitive um, and takes a lot of time and um, involves high human costs. So, but there are a lot of methods out there that allow us to summarize text data with respect to pieces of information that are relevant to us. And we are comparing some of the most common ones. Um, and even if you make a decision for a certain method for all of them, there are plenty of open source tools out there that use seemingly very similar implementations of these algorithms. And our question there was, can we pick either one and get the same result, or is that not true? And um, I'll, I'll say a little bit of the for, for that now and then later. It's basically not true. It heavily, all these results or the whole impression you actually get about the success and events as they unfolded for emergency response heavily depend on choices that humans make and have to make for, for selecting sources, technologies, and implementations. And our goal here is to guide a little bit people in, in making good choices there that lead to reliable and comprehensive understandings. So let's dig a little bit into deep, uh, deeper. Um, this, uh, this slide here is of benefit to people who sit in the front because the font is very tiny. Um, but I'll, I'll walk you through this. So in our analysis framework on the very left, we start with five different data sources. Even I can't read that, actually. Um, so we have social media data, which we collected through the Twitter API. We work with newspaper data, which we collected through a subs subscription service from the university. Um, we also got weblog data from, from experts. And then we have two accounts of um, data generated or provided by actually responders in the field and involved with the response. One of them are governmental re reports that we collected um, from open sources. And then we also had the great pleasure to interview um, five people who were involved with the Haiti response and who were generous enough to um, dedicate um, some of their time and effort to answer our questions about what actually happened, how did the response go, how did the um, Haiti earthquake scenario unfold, and what did exactly what did they do on the scene. Um, we do not expect the first responders that we interviewed to provide us all of the information, but we definitely are sure that they provided accurate um, information, so that's, that's actually reliable, unbiased um, information. And then we did a lot of data pre-processing. Raw data is often very noisy, so we cleaned them up. We deduplicated them. We made sure that individual words are actual words, and we removed some noise, and we enhanced the data with syntactically relevant and semantically relevant additional information on text data, such as chromatical functions, for example. 
And then we used three open source implementations for doing text summarization or eliciting the gist of information from a large body of text data. One of them is a very, very trivial, straightforward thing. Um, TFIDF stands for term frequency times inverse document frequency. And that's a very straightforward algorithm that basically takes the natural log of the product of term frequency times inverse document frequency. And what that gives you is basically a high-ranking score for the words that are unique and highly salient in a text collection, and it will bump the score to the bottom for words that are noisy or that are very generic in that text collection. So that's a way to find highly descriptive terms. Then we did pretty old school thing, keyword in context gives, gives you the contextual embedding of a word into things that it often co-occurs with that can give you semantical meaning clusters, but also shows you in a specific text collection how is the term typically embedded. This is kind of the baby old school version of word embeddings. Um, if, if any, how many of you have done deep learning stuff with word embeddings? Yeah, right, that's what we do nowadays. And if you would have done this many years ago, that would have been your thing. But the idea is very similar. Um, and last but not least, we use topic modeling, which is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm that tries to that uses latent Dirichlet allocation to identify salient um, collections of words that represent themes from a text collection and what it will return from an input set of documents that consist of words are basically vectors of a user-defined size and number of words that are descriptive of these latent themes, but it's still, since it's an unsupervised method, um, like any clustering algorithm, for example, too, it's still up to a human to interpret these clusters and validate these clusters. And that is also true for TF, IDF, and keywords and context you could say they are all unsupervised methods. The first ones are not really machine learning. The third one certainly is. All right. And then um, we do all of this, and then we always hold one thing constant, need two things constant, and vary one, and see what sort of results we get. Um, in the end, we compare these sets of results to each other and also to the ground truth, where the ground truth is coming from actual humans at the scene. And here our goal is to understand what is most close to human-provided accounts of emergency operations. That would be a good proxy for a human, so you don't have to bother humans and talk to them because these people are busy and actually are out there in the field. In the case of the Coast Guard who worked with us, dragging people out of the water and saving lives. Um, but it might also be interesting to understand which, um, which accounts or, or which sources are most different from what first responders say, say and still truthful because this, this is supplemental information that also enhances your understanding of a situation. Okay, um, and then here's also a quick summary of the results, but I'll walk you through these results in more detail over the next slides. So, one of the first things we did is taking a couple of different sources. We did that for all of the sources. I'm showing you that for some of them here. And see, like, what kind of information do you get? And this was done in a human-in-the-loop fashion where we combined automated techniques with human annotation and interpretation. Um, we got a pretty high intercoder reliability in the end on our human-in-the-loop processes. And from, from these results, on the very first course level, we can see that news data focuses on entities that are involved in the response and entities that are affected by the response. So those are either responders or um, people such as families, survivors, children. Um, for keywords and context as well as um, blogs, we see that they are way more focused on actions um, and also a little bit on sentiment and um, human reactions, which we didn't see in the newspaper. Um, so if one wanted to have a summary of the events that are actually happening, not so much on like who did it, but what happened, then these other two sources would probably be a better choice. We also did not see much of effect. Okay, let me see, is there, is there even a pointer here? Oh, perfect. Right, news data, pretty neutral, 
as expected, kind of as it should be. But if you want to get into user reactions or like how did people feel about it, we get a little bit of that on Twitter and even more so on blogs, which is kind of um, surprising. But a lot more action happening here and more focus on like entities and account I mean, entities is a good way that leads to accountability, who did things, who executed stuff, and who was the recipients of these activities that we get more from news data. Okay. So let's move on. Um, in the next step, um, we looked at how much um, or what source of what source of an impression do we get depending on what 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 sources we look at. This is always on the same thing. The event doesn't change. What changes is how we look at that event and what technology we use to do that. So here you can see um, this is the first the first block here. This is from our interviews that we conducted. Conducting interviews is very expensive. It takes time and effort, and, and people don't do what they are really supposed to do. At least the people who are being asked these questions. Um, so if we have something that highly overlaps with that, that would be great because then we could save their time. And we can see that, um, so these are the, the human labels that we assign to these, to these um, latent Dirichlet allocation output processes. We get a lot of stuff on inner agency coordination, which makes sense because that's exactly what these people were there in order to do. Um, military information and things on the Haiti government. So here you, I mean, clearly this is the US Coast Guard. And here you can see that this whole operation is basically military support response to, to, to an event. If we go into social media, we get a whole lot more, um, well, we got a lot of stuff on donations, a lot of calls for donations and people encouraging to provide donations. We get personal reactions, prayers, affected, things like that. And um, first-hand and second-hand evidence of situations on the ground, videos, photos, things like that. Um, Blocks, very generic. We get climate change thing, which I'm a little bit surprised about because I don't think that earthquakes have anything to do with global warming. That's a very far stretch, but I'm not that kind of a scientist, so I don't, don't want to make a claim about that. Um, and then if you look into regular news, we, we again get things for fundraising aid, but also reports on damages. So all of these clearly on the same thing from a very similar time frame, but the impression you get on what was important, who was important, and what has been happening totally depends on what source you look at. Okay, um, then we compared what overlaps most with the ground truth. And um, it's basically blocks for reasons. Um, so what you see here are things that the underlined words are those that overlap most with the ground truth. Yeah, um, and you can see that for, for blocks, that's, that's typically pretty high. And also keywords and context are apparently a good method to capture a lot of the ground truth information if that is your goal. Sometimes that's exactly what you want. You want to resemble or get as close to, to ground truth. And if, if that's the goal, we kind of know what's the best way to do. It's not 100% overlap, but it's a good approximation. If you want to have a supplemental view, then there are also good ways to do that. Um, and then you can probably skip the things in the middle because they are kind of redundant with either end which was also our goal to identify. And then Lee over here came up with this beautiful artichoke diagram that kind of tries to put that all together and it um, takes a while to, to look at. But that basically shows what overlaps with what, how much. Um, Twitter is pretty far off or social media is pretty far off from what blogs and news providers with blogs have the highest overlap in a way with first responders. So they are a good approximation whereas if you want a totally different picture of the situation than everybody's favorite, oops, oops, no, not that quick, social media um, can provide that. But it's, that is a very low overlap with um, what actually happened in the crown truth. And then down here is, is the content on what's actually in, in these bubbles. OK. Um, so last but not least, what do we learn from this? This is, in the end, the kind of recommendations we came up with. Depending on what you want to understand, a broad picture, a narrow overlap with the crown truth, um, there are different sources and methods that provide us that. Also for these methods, um, all of them, since they are kind of unsupervised, you have to make choices. There is no way not to make choices. The first choice is to pick one of the pack. You can build it from scratch. 
and I guess most of the people uh, in this room have probably done something like that. But there isn't really a need to. You can use the open source implementation. Um, they are reproducible, they are transparent, you know what's going on. Um, but if you look for open source tool for, let's say, topic modeling, there are probably 50 things out there. And how do you know which one to use? You could use the one that everybody or that many people are using, and that could narrow your filter to five options. And then you still have to make a decision. And once you actually have one of these things that you decided for, you have to set parameters. And they all have an impact. It's not that these parameters don't matter. For example, for topic modeling, you have to provide it with a stop word list. Um, you have to decide how many topics you want to retrieve and, retrieve, and all of these things will impact your results. Um, so, so what we came up with here are the best or are the settings that get us most close to crown truth. And if we had chosen a different setting, then we would still get results. These things don't come back empty. They, say, they don't say no words. There are always words, right? Um, if you go from words to words, there's always something. Um, but, but they are very different. And these are the settings that we identified as being most overlapping with the crown truth. So that's what I have for you from this first project we did, and I do explicitly also want to acknowledge the Coast Guard folks who were diligently working with us on this effort, not only in terms of giving us access to people we can interview, which was super exciting to, to listen to them, but also in terms of helping us interpret finding, helping us understand the context in which they work, um, and helping us connecting us to other learning resources that help us getting more information about these particular application scenarios of disaster informatics and emergency response. So that was, that was great, and we are very happy to still have them on board for this new project. They're going to be here in a little less than a month from now, and we are looking forward to further con um, connecting with them. Maybe some of them are online right now. I don't know. Um, okay, so we hope that this information helps um, first responders who are considering using these methods to make good decisions, to make informed and reliable decisions that help them to get a holistic understanding of professionally and user-generated content and reactions to emergencies as they are unfolding. That could be in real time, that could also be in near to real time, um, and all of these technologies are already there, so we didn't reinvent any wheel here. We, we, made, we basically did an assessment of what's a good wheel to use. Okay, so that was stage one, and now currently we are working to build on top of that and from the text data we have, and additional text data on additional events, um, try to elicit relational structure that basically describe the socio-technical complexity and reality of emergency response in terms of socio-technical networks that um, represent which agents are doing what stuff and need or produce what resources in order to do that. So that's a classic information and relation extraction task where we use machine learning methods, natural language processing methods, and AI methods to extract relevant entities from text data. And our entities here are people, organizations, tasks, events, and resources see how not only that, but how they are related to each other, the how they are related to each other is a link labeling task. And then in step two, once we have these reliable relational structures that we um, get from text data, compare that to policy, existing policy that basically outlines what should happen. So on the left-hand side, what we get with our text mining methods that leverage the first project is empirical evidence for what did happen. And then what you see on the right-hand side is policy national frameworks that define what should happen. All right, why do we do that? We do that in order to identify three things. First of all, What's going well? These are the true positives, things that should happen and are happening. Number two, false positives. Those are emergency interactions and response activities that are not prescribed in policies and frameworks, but that responders are routinely able 
and apparently willing to perform. These could, these could be things that can be added to policy frameworks. They, they are being done. They are not in the framework. They are not prescribed, but they are being done. Maybe they are done in order to be able to do a next thing. That, that could be constraint propagation thing, or it's an additional thing. And then um, number three, we are also interested in false negatives, things that are prescribed but are not happening. And if that's routinely not being done, then maybe these things are very challenging to do or they don't apply, but that both, both of these things, we believe, um, are useful to revise policy. And we are very grateful that we are being given access to people who will work on policies and who can help us to transition here from empirical scientific work to actually talking to policy deciders or policy people and see if this is um, of benefit to them. All right, so in our first research, the first research question is all about generating these guys. How can we use NLP in order to extract these structures from text data? And I have a couple of people, um, for example, Ping Ying, who was sitting there. Hello. Yep. Um, thinking about uh, what are good strategies and experimental designs and methods to do that. We already have done much of that work. I'll show you some of that in a minute. Um, so that's step number one building reliable methods and configurations to extract relational data from text data. I'll say a few words about that. These, these methods for getting relational information from unstructured natural language text data that often comes sometimes with a little bit of structure, most often not, um, it's a very common thing. It's re relevant for what I just showed you. It's also a very common thing in information retrieval, text summarization, and it has a lot of practic practical applications. There are tons of methods out there for that. Here's a short little overview on qualitative and quantitative old and new methods for extracting relational data from text data. The one we are using is um, a couple of them. One of them is basically machine learning, probabilistic graphical models and machine learning that allow you to automate something, build abstraction models and generali generalize to new and unseen domains. But we are also using other things here. For example, um, what else are we using? Uh, network text analysis, another thing we, we have in here. So um, the, when you do this, when you extract um, text, network data from text data, it's a very finite set of options for you to work with or par parameters to work with. One of them, um, or what's, what's our nodes? The nodes can either be words as they occur in the text data. Um, sometimes it's also the sources who wrote a piece of text data. It's not what we are using. And it can also be metadata or higher level concepts that are implicitly contained in the data and can be inferred, for example, for inference methods. And then for creating edges, it's also a finite set of options. Most often, and most of the work that's out there, these edges are constructed based on simple co-location um, of things. And that's not completely intuitive. For a lot of um, probabilistic models, any Markov chain model, co-location is the most important information. If, if, if I would build a network from people in a room, a logical choice is to do this based on people sitting next to each other. And text is the same thing. It's worth sitting next to each other. So that's a very common thing that people do, and it has a logical grounding in regular network analysis that's basically based on geophysical proximity. Number two is, logic, uh, yeah, is logical or grammatical relationships. Then there are meaningful relationships, semantics. Um, world knowledge, pragmatics is what people often want, but that requires a lot of domain understanding and often manual and qualitative labor. Um, things can be logically defined. Um, or it can be statistical, which is what's done most often nowadays too. So, so very common these days is still co-occurrence stuff and learning these things. And since, since we want to, again, give people good guidelines for how to use existing stuff, we are focusing on the most common solutions. We could also develop something new. And in the end, we actually are doing this because we are combining some of them and putting some rules on top of... Um, straightforward solutions to achieve domain adaptation. But um, we are leveraging what's already out there, which is a very ecological approach, and then making that better as opposed to you know, doing it from scratch. And our experimental design, again, is very straightforward. We are using um, 
readily available various data sources that people, not us, people out there who know what they are doing, have annotated for entities and relations, and we basically look at the properties of these resulting networks to understand what's the best method to reproduce um, these relational structures. So we take the annotated data, we consider that as tr ground truth, we use that for validation. Then we throw all the annotations away from the data, apply common text analysis methods to the un or de-annotated data and see which of the results most closely match the ground truth. So we are not trying to build a new method that optimizes against reproducing ground truth. We are trying to see out of the vast majority of methods that are out there and tools that are out there that are at people's disposal, which of them perform best under what conditions or for what properties of the data such that people out there in the field can use what, what exists um, with good confidence. All right, um, so we construct a couple of different of these graphs based on co-occurrence, based on syntactic grammatical relationships, and based on more involved deep parsing relationships. Then we assess um, accuracy in terms of Recall, which is out of all the, so if I wanted to know which, which people in this room are students, then my, my, my best way to capture all of them is to basically say all of these people are students. That will give me a 100% recall rate. Um, but then we know, for example, that two people in the room, or I know that, I don't know how many else, um, are not students. So precision measures all of all the people we retrieved, how many of them actually are students. So recall is coverage and precision is accuracy. And because these two things with optimization algorithms and convex optimization often are inversely correlated, they are often being put in relationship to each other by calculating a harmonic or other sort of mean. And that's in, uh, in text mining called the F value. So that's the F value is kind of an, uh, an average or really a harmonic mean of precision and recall. And what's often being tried is to find the point where both of them are highest. What's, that's the highest F value. So that's a shamelessly stolen slide from Wikipedia on recall and precision. Um, the data sets we have are different ones, and we are also currently processing additional ones that come from different sources, different types of information. One of them is online data, one of them is scientific paper, one, uh, scientific uh, information, one of them is news data. So different genres, they all are pretty large scale in terms of nodes and edges, so there are a couple of um, thousand nodes and um, little less edges. And then we basically try to reproduce them. I'm showing you a, um, an example here for co-location. As I said, co-location is the most common thing that people use for that. And the red line is recall, the blue line is F, and the yellow line is precision. Nee, the, the blue line is precision and the yellow line is F. And you can see that um, we can get pretty high recall. We can get up to 100% recall, and the window size, the, the number of things in between relevant items doesn't even need to be that high. But it comes at the cost of precision, and that's because when we have right, high recall, we pick up a whole lot of false positives. Um, so one thing here to be with then to enhance this with rules and say, okay, we have high recall. How do we filter out all the false positives? And my students are currently working on that. So that's enhancing a straightforward thing with a rule-based thing in order to get us to basically a higher F value. But if we use off-the-shelf things, which is often being done, you get very dense networks that are full of things you don't want to see in there. To frame this in the most positive way. Um, then we also, so then we did this iteratively, iteratively for all of the additional methods. Here we did um, we also have the um, syntactic and deep parsing things involved. And so far our results show that the best we can do is using um, deep parsing, but still accuracy is not good. This is this is nothing I would want to rely on. So with the best off the shelf things, we get up to the highest thirty percent of um, of a F value. Oftentimes because recall is high and precision is lower. And what can we do in these cases? And that's a very common thing to do. 
Well, you could either build a full-fledged learning thing, but then you have things with domain adaptation and, and semantic drift over time and all of these things, or you can come up with a couple of heuristics that are being built on top of these things in order to get higher accuracy, and that's exactly what we are working on right now. And if people have more ideas on that or questions or concerns, I would love to um, hear back from people. Then we also um, produce actual graph structures to see our, how similar are these networks. You can have situations where you produce very similar graph structures from a graph metrics point of view, but it could be the wrong entities that are in there. So we are also making sure that that's not happening. Um, and currently, so far, we have, have a couple of findings. We are still working on all of these experiments. Um, if you want to have high recall, for example, if recall is really important to you, um, for example, if you have a small data set and you might want to have high recall, uh, then these co-location things are good. If you have a lot of data, which often is the case um, with, with, with modern data sources, then these co-location things are not good because um, you pick up way too much data. And then um, lo looking into some of these parsing algorithms um, is a good idea. So far, we cannot recommend any of for the off-the-shelf the, off methods if accuracy is your goal. Um, but these off-the-shelf things can be enhanced with better rules, and we are doing that. In fact, we are building this all into an open source toolkit such that people can take that and given certain properties of the data, size, domain, structure, um, length of documents, and so on and so forth, can decide what's my best bet to get into what ballpark range of accuracy. So basically to set realistic expectations and giving people guidelines for how to, for how to meet their expectations. And then once we have that, once we have these relational structures, actually let me switch, let me see if I can easily do this. Um, let me switch back to a picture here. Once we have these relational structures, oftentimes the links are binary. Um, these, these links here, there is a link or there isn't. And that can be nice, and sometimes that's all you need. For example, if you have one more data where the interaction is people knowing each other, then you don't need link labeling because you already know what the meaning of a link is. But if we have these sorts of structures where agents and organizations and resources and events are connected to each other, it's not clear what the meaning of a link is. So we are also currently working on lab link labeling methods in order to enhance the binary existence or frequency count of a link with actual semantic meaning that we also also derived from the text data and the semantic field of the words between these entities or surrounding these entities. So that's our link labeling task. Um, that's new science work, and I'm super excited about that. Let me go back to where we were. And then once we have our correct graphs and our links, um, our last but not least step is to basically do graph comparisons in order to compare our empirically accurately retrieved networks with um, given policy information that represent these network structures and see, okay, how much do they overlap? Maybe 100%, that would be great. Um, how much additional stuff do we find in our empirical data? Those are things that could be this, um, considered for policy enhancement, and how many things are in our are not in our data that should be there, those might be things that could be considered for policy revisions to align policy with reality of response over time. So that's, um, that's our goals, and at this point, I welcome questions and comments from people. Thank you. I don't know how we do this. Are, there, are we taking questions from the room first? Whatever happens. Whatever happens. Yeah, what's your question? Okay, but are you talking about, for example, like some structural dam like uh, information, like, I don't know, number of damaged houses, or are you talking about sentiment? Like, I just am not clear on exactly what it is you're trying to... Very good point. Want. A very good point. At the highest level, an accurate summary of large amounts of information. That's really what happened, who was involved, what did they, and what resources were involved. Because these are often things that are highly relevant to responders. These very accurate things on how many houses involved or amount of damage in lives and dollars, that's not what we are doing. The other thing you mentioned, 
how do people feel about it, user reactions, we also cover that, and that's the sentiment um, or effect part. Um, that's not really our focus, but since the data have that, we do consider that. And as you saw in news, that's not a thing. Okay, fine, not right uh, to be expected, but other data have that, and, it, and that's also relevant to us, but maybe also the responders to see um, how did this source project on how things went. Doesn't mean that's the truth. This is just how, what, through, depending on the lens you look, what sort of a impression you get and how was the success of the response judged by people who generate content for that particular source. So yes, we are definitely interested in that. Especially since success of response is a very big deal um, to, to, to people who run these operations. Um, they have, of course, internal assessments and validations, but the world is also looking, right, and, and providing feedback, and, and we are considering that as well. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. I have a kind of um, technical question about your data that you use. I, I'm using this. So, um, the way I see it, social media and um, articles published by government, their, their style and tone and language is different. Totally so I was, I was just wondering whether you normalized to narrow down the gaps between like differences in language between the sources that you Th use? That's a very good question. No, intentionally not, because we want to see, depending on who you listen to, what to expect. So that's almost like a um, belief propagation thing. But the question here is, we, we don't want to normalize any of that. We want to see... If I, if I take my little device and I listen to these people, if, let's assume all these sources are sensors, right? Depending what sensor we use, what sort of a signal do they produce and what does that signal mean? So if we, if we look at different um, types of sensors, our sensors are all human, um, depending on which one you use, you, you get a very different vibe from them and a very different summary and a very different overlap with what the actual people on the ground will tell you. So we are actually interested in the differences between these sources and how that relates to um, ground truth information. Does, does that make sense? But still, the actual noise that is in these data, we try to control for that. Duplication is very common. Um, Things lost in translation, we remove URLs because, and we remove handles, and there are a couple of things we do and standardize and normalize, and we only use data in English, for example. That's another limitation. Sure. Um, but we, we do want to have the idiosyncrasies of the source without the noise. I guess that's, that's our goal here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we do have an online question. Um, it, they say that you're giving an awesome talk, first of all. Thank you. Um, it says, is the tool for network validation part of the context tool? Sorry, just a second. It's a very smart, those are people who know us. <laughs> you have um, for network construction from the tech. Yeah, so Context is an open source tool that my group has been developing over the last few years, and we are baking the outcomes from this work into that tool. So I appreciate the question, and I appreciate that people actually... Oh, that's <laughs> yeah, so sweet. All right, um, all right. Hey, Shoop. <laughs> but yes, we are, we are aiming to put this all into an open source implementation such that people can play with it and can make use of it if, if they find it useful. I do want to mention that Context is not the best text mining tool out there. Au contraire. Um, if you are a technical person, there are way better and more scalable things. Context is built in order to help non-technical people and practitioners out there without a data science degree that involved five Python classes to make use of standard and up, uh, current um, up-to-date, um, cutting-edge text mining methods in order to analyze data. It's, it's not super scalable, it's not run in the cloud, it's no distributed computing, it's basic implementations, fully transparent, well-documented, and tested and validated by us that we hope people find useful to bring text mining and natural language processing to non-technical fields such as crisis informatics, political science, and, and all these fields where we have folks with um, other skill sets wanting to analyze large volumes of text data. It 
Fantastic. Well, then I'm thanking everybody for your time and attention. If people want to get involved with this work, let us know. We are excited to bring people in and work with us and help us learn together. Um, if people have more questions, my email address is not on this, um, but my name disambiguates well. It's Jana Diesner. It's easy to find on the internet. And we are happy to hear from people, especially from um, responders. I guess there is a question. Yes. Samira um, asked the question. Um, also friends <laughs> of the group. And one of our interns. Hi, Samira. <laughs> no, old Siri intern. Um, yes. Have you used MI as well? Oh, machine learning, sorry. Thank you. Yes, um, so for example, uh, topic modeling is an unsupervised machine learning thing. We have been using that. For, for these network constructions, currently we are using off-the-shelf things. Um, we haven't thrown machine learning in. We could do that. We, you can always learn a model. Um, but then you have a trained model, and that's, that's what we wanted to avoid here. But um, that's, that's an option that people can play with. And then she also says, what was the tech, T-E-C? All different ones. We, we, uh, we, we use, oh, what was the technique for, can you read the question again? She just, uh, going off of your, her first question about machine learning. Oh, we use topic modeling and, and basically standard latent Dirichlet allocation implementation in Mallet. Um, nothing fancy there. And we did that because that tool has been around, been around for a while. It's continuously updated. It's scientific standards. It's a benchmark that people compare things against. And that's exactly what we want to leverage, common things that are trustworthy and, and as an open box, white box out there. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, and great seeing you all. And let's continue exciting work with Siri at Illinois. Thank you. Thank you.